Okay, we've got a guest joining me now is Dr. Patrick Moore. He is the former founder and leader of Greenpeace, who is now a nuclear energy advocate of the Clean and Safe Energy Coalition and their website. And I think this is an admirable group, so I want to stress that it is cleansafeenergy.org. Welcome to the show, Dr. Moore. Thanks, Dennis. I just uh, I just read a, in, last night a little auto, autobiographical bio, you explaining your genesis from a, uh, I don't know, logical <laughs> positivist through a uh, swashbuckling uh, activist through sort of consensus-seeking pragmatist. I must say I found it endearing and rather insightful. I like guys who learn things as they get older. Uh, put it in your own words a little. Where would you start? Where are you now? Well, where I am now is trying to make sense of the climate change debate, and it's just so ironic that the people who say that we're going to have a catastrophe in the world come to an end if we don't stop burning fossil fuels, they, they tend to be the ones that are mostly against the alternative technologies such as hydroelectric and nuclear power, which could actually make a difference. Yes, especially, I mean, on a, on a silly sort of, uh, you know, uh, makes good headlines, the wind power off Nantucket, and less the water for me, but the, uh, the, the, listen, even the softest, most indecisive guys in the world, the French, have made great hay over the last few decades with nuclear energy, haven't they? Where are we at? Well, the, the comparison between France and Germany is the one that I really like. France has 80% nuclear power, almost no fossil fuels for its electricity production, it's in line with climate change policy, and they export more electricity than any other country in Europe. In fact, they're the only major exporter of electricity in the whole of Western Europe. Right next door in Germany, they are, they are bound into a process of shutting down all 17 of their nuclear plants, which provide 30% of their electricity. Meanwhile, they say they're going to reduce CO2 emissions by 20% by the year 2020. These two things are mutually exclusive, absolutely impossible to accomplish simultaneously, Meanwhile, Germany is importing billions of dollars worth of nuclear electricity from France. So who has the, the functional and who has the dysfunctional energy policy? And the countries are right next door to each other. It's like they've actually known each other for quite a while, and they are, they are on completely different tracks, one that works and one that is not going to. Well, the, the, the Germans are uh, historically known as making the massive wrong turn, so uh, that doesn't surprise me. But if we've come down to the juncture of... France and Germany approach to nuclear power, which, which way, what turn signal does our country have on at this point? Well, fortunately, right now, 20% of the electricity in the U.S. is from nuclear energy. Uh, that has been a pretty steady figure for quite a while now, as the, the existing nuclear plants, which have not increased in number, there's 104 of them, have not, have not changed substantially for about 20 years, but they have learned how to run them so much more efficiently and to be online so much more often. Mm -hmm. They are producing a lot more power now than they did when they were first built. Now, the, the, the important thing to note is that those 104 nuclear plants are the equivalent of taking 100 million automobiles off the road in terms of avoided carbon emissions that would otherwise happen if that electricity was being produced with fossil fuels. There's no other technology that offsets as much carbon emissions as nuclear technology, and there's no reason why we can't have a doubling or tripling of these clean and safe plants which do not contribute to air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, and they are safe. I mean, it's actually safer to work in the nuclear industry, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor, than it is to work in either financial services or real estate. It, it, it's, it's safer to, to be a member of the public around a nuclear plant than it is to be a member of the public around a coal-fired plant. That's just a... Well, then let me ask you this, Dr. Moore. Why the insane, dare I say, schizophrenic bifurcation on the left between fixing this and not using the solution? Well, I don't know. I just say that some people are stuck in the 70s, and they've invested so much money and time in convincing their supporters that nuclear is evil that they just can't make the about face in the face of an obvious contradiction that they have in their policy now, because nuclear energy has never injured a single member of the public in the United States. Even Three Mile Island, which was the worst accident, was really just a bad mechanical failure. But the dome that was built... The, the, the protective dome that was built to contain the nuclear waste in the event of an accident, it worked. it worked. The engineers got it right. Exactly. Now, listen, I was thinking that I had felt some sort of tipping point coming up where we were going, the left was just going to have to concede because they looked amazingly stupid not conceding that we needed more nuclear energy plants. And as you said, the process has been 
uh, updated, and they've gotten smoother with that, but the infrastructure is still, like you said, stuck in the 70s. But then we had the Japan quake, and once again, it's in the headlines. I'm wondering, is this going to set us back another decade that there was a puddle of water after an earthquake in the Japanese uh, nuclear center? You know, Dennis, I don't think so. I think right now we've got over 70% of the American public supporting increased nuclear power. The people who live near nuclear plants are the strongest supporters of those plants because they know they've operated clean and safe for decades, and they know they are great wealth-creating machine as well. They say the closer you get to a nuclear plant, the better the schools and roads are. Hmm, explain and, that to me, Patrick. Explain that. That's fascinating. What, what do you feel the, the connective tissue is there? How does that happen? Well, first off, the, 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 the 800 or so employees that work in each nuclear plant make 40 percent above the average wage hmm. they are highly educated people they tend to be active in their communities at community development and social programs and it's just a fact that those little plants and, and con for the amount of power they put out they have the smallest footprint of any energy technology they are producing huge amounts of clean power and they're making their communities wealthier. So it's an excellent tentpole for the community in addition to providing us with the energy we need it sounds like a good point of departure for somebody to put a town together, as it were. Um, listen, It's so the way to go. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm all in favor of wind energy and geothermal energy and hydro energy and other renewables, but they can't do it by themselves. Right. The only way to really reduce fossil fuels is a combination of renewables plus nuclear. This is our fix. It is right there in front of us, and it is one of the reasons the obstinacy on the left about things like this and other things that has driven me away from that. It has become so strident. I don't know if your experience has been like mine, Patrick, but are you... Are you amazed at the, the, the rancor that happens as you go out the door on that side of things? Uh, have, have you gotten a lot of angry response? A lot, yes, and it's mostly name-calling and has nothing to do with the discussion. And the reason I left 20 years ago after 15 years in the leadership of Greenpeace was because it had become so intellectually sterile that you couldn't even debate a single word in the policy anymore. It's ideology and religion rather than science and, and logic, and I, I just can't go there. My education is in science. None of my fellow Greenpeace directors had an education in science, and we're mostly in it for the politics and the career and the glory and all of that, and I just had to leave. Right. It is, uh, you know, Gore, I don't know if Gore realizes this, but he has given a rallying point to pragmatists like me when he says the words, the debate is over. Now I hear other people saying that the debate is over, and I think, my God, if I was a scientist, and I'm not, I'm just a pragmatist, but I, I, I was offended by that. If I was a scientist, I would think that is the very antithesis of the scientific process, isn't it? Absolutely. I, I personally, as a scientist, believe that we have a duty to remain critical and even a bit skeptical about, especially when there's the so-called consensus, because consensus is not a scientific term. It's a socio-political term, often indicating a herd mentality where everybody wants to join the club and be on the bandwagon. And I just don't trust that sort of thing. I, I always want to be questioning that, even though I wouldn't describe myself as a denier, but I certainly am skeptical about some of the absolutist statements that are being made. Nor would I. The climate. I don't want to be a denier. I want to be open-headed and open-minded at this point does not dictate that you feel New York's going to be underwater in 50 years. I don't know what that gets us. To me, that seems like a careerist statement on Gore's part. And I just, like you said, I, I, every time I see people flocking together in that lemming collective, uh, you know, when everybody's rugby scrumming around with their head down, I tend to avoid that. Sounds like you do, too. I don't know what that means. I makes do, it. too, yes. And, and, you know, Al Gore, actually, though, in some ways is nuclear energy's best friend because what he is saying, even though he doesn't talk about nuclear much, automatically drives policymakers towards looking for energy that doesn't produce greenhouse gases. And there it is, staring you in the face. Yeah, but Gore, he knows that right now he goes out and he's feted. He's an important man as he gives these speeches. And he knows if he puts What's the buzzkill suffix on this at the end about it being the answer being nuclear energy? The people are so strident in his audience right now. His core demo is such zealots that they're, they're going to boo him. That old, that old taint what has otherwise been a delightful evening as a visionary. Well, listen, Patrick Moore, I'm enamored of you. I think you took a brave step there, and good for you. It's tough to come in off that... Uh, you know, out there on the boat, saving the whales, listening to Desperado on your iPod, come in here and actually sully, <laughs> sully your imprint on certain contingents of the, the populace who just want to hear you parrot the same thing over and over. Good for you, Patrick Moore. This is the Dennis Miller Show.